Hello. Let's start the section, the Edwards Life Science section, with a very interesting topic, uh, overcoming challenges of the balloon expandable, expandable Tavi cases. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here to moderate this section. And uh, first of all, I'd like to, to thank Edwards for this nice invitation. And uh, I have as a co-moderator, Dr. Jaime Cabrales from Bogota, Colombia. Dr. Jaime is the direct director of interventional cardiolo cardio infant foundation in Bogota, Colombia. I, I, I'm sure that it's gonna be a very interesting session uh, because we have uh, very well-known physicians, speakers, with a lot of expertise in TAV procedures. So uh, we are gonna, the, the meeting, we are gonna have two speeches followed by 10 minutes of discussion and then more two speeches followed 10 minutes of discussions, okay? So uh, at this moment, I'd like to, to invite Dr. Jaime, Dr. Jaime, please, to, to present the first speech. We're gonna, change, we're gonna do a, a little change in the program of the, the, the session. And Dr. John will introduce the first speak, speaker. Please, Dr. John. Thank you, Dr. Mangioni. Uh, yes, we have a, a small change in, in, in the meeting and we wanna start the meeting with a, a very interesting uh, uh, conference about aortic valve in bulk in, in small annulus does the mean the final grading meeting? There is, is this for this uh, session we have the Dr. Adolfo Ferrero, who is interventional cardiologist, titular professor of interventional cardiologist at the University Institute of Science of Cordoba. Please, Adolfo, go ahead. Okay, we have David Wood now, but let's continue. Hello, everybody. Can you take a look at my page? Yes, computer? it's, okay. it's yes. perfect. Perfect, I uh, know. Thank you. First of all, I would like to say thank you again to Solasi, to Cassie and Edwards for, for this invitation. It's my pleasure to, to, to share this meeting with all of you, especially with Philip, because Dr. Pivarot, because this topic is is one of the preference that he has. So my topic today is aortic valve in valve in small annulus. Does the final gradient matter? First of all, that's my conflict of interest. I am a Edwards proctor, but I never put my intellectual integrity in, in this match. When we talk about gradient, uh, we refer to patient prothesis mismatch. So we can say that uh, this term is related to a prothesis that has normal function, but is too small for the body surface area of the patient and for his or her uh, cardiac output. So it results in, in high gradient, especially up to 20 millimeters of mercury. So you, you can define this type of, of problem in moderate or severe or non. And we know, everybody know that it is in, in the surgical field related with events. Take a look at here at, at this page, I, I put some, but there are a lot of problems related with patient prothesis mismatch. So early mortality, late mortality, mortality in patients less than 70 years old, um, uh, less decrease in the left ventricle mass, up to 40% of uh, re-hospitalization or heart failure, and well, less improving in the functional class, a lot of different problems. But are this, are this type of problem present in the TABR field? Well, let's look inside this trial, which says, yes, that there is a problem. I am not sure, 
but let's analyze together and then uh, let discuss after all. You can see here, this is the TBT registry, which has more than 60,000 patients, up to 37,000 we have, or we have very um, trustable data. So we have like uh, two, uh, 12% of uh, severe patient paralysis mismatch and about 25% of moderate. And we take a look at the event in, in terms of mortality, you can see the moderate or non PPM is more or less the same and is statistically significant in terms of the comparison with severe, severe is a prototype patient mismatch. So the, the great, this great number of patients made that this small number is significant, it's okay. And if we take a look at death plus re-hospitalization, we have a more significant statistically uh, the difference in severe and in comparison with moderate or non prosthesis patient mismatch. But if we took a, a, a deep look into the, the spatial data, we can see that patients with severe prosthesis mismatch are slightly different. And we can for sure think that this difference, especially in chronic lung disease, renal failure, and more cabbage or, or all this data could be the reason why they have more, more events. So it's, I think that could be at least due to this type of difference and not the, the gradient itself. So I will use this title as my sub subtitle. Is the lower the better? Think beyond the gradient after transcatheter aortic valve replacement for small annulus. And we can see here, I, I will analyze before going to valve in valve, what, what is happening in, in native aortic. Take a look at this study in, in the, the paradigm of the patient with small annulus, which is Japanese people. And they designed this trial to compare two type of valves, Evolutar and Sapien 3. And they said that uh, the affected orifice area is better in, or is greater in Evolutar, that we have more prosthesis patient mismatch moderate in Sapien 3, and also that the mean gradient is greater with Sapien 3. Let's say that Sapien 3 works not properly for this type of patient. But when we see uh, what happening in, for example, in, in this beautiful picture that they show how they increase, how you can see the increase in the valve area, how decrease the gradient in patient with annulus less than 33, and sorry, 23, and, and also in 21, there is an increase in the area and the gradient, but it's, it is in favor of the evolute R. So when you analyze the, the, the result of, of this study, you see this different. You have less mortality in Sapien 3 in both groups, especially in the extremely small annulus, which is less than 21. So there are certain different, you said, the valve is, is better in terms of this type of difference, but when you analyze the event, it, it, it seems that it's, it's not the same, even worse. And when you take a look at the, in this study related to particle, you can see that after a, a very complex patient select, selection, they end up with more or less 400 patients and they compare Portico with what they call commercially available valves. And 
You can see here again, this beautiful picture saying that Portico and Evolute R has the, the similar uh, orifice area, less gradient. And if they compare this with Edwards, they said that they have better area and, and better gradient than, Port, than, than Edwards. But when we see the mortality, you can see that the mortality is, is higher in, in the other group. So the, the same again, the valves looks, seems to be better because the gradient and the area, but when you compare the vents, something is happening because Edward is working better. I disagree with the interpretation of, of the, or, or the conclusion of the trial because there is a difference, but let's say that it is okay. These discrepancies, that could be related to the limitation of the Bermuji theorem, that is what ECHO is measuring. Probably, you, you, we know since a lot of years that there is a difference between what ECHO is measuring and what is catheter measuring. Is, there is a mismatch in favor of catheter, normally you, you, the, the, the gradient is less. And they did a comparison in, with Senshut valves and also with Hancock valves. And there is a difference. Take a look at this graphic, the long the distance you put the catheter in the aorta in comparison with the plane of the valve, the less the gradient you, you obtain with Senshut and exactly the same that with Hanko. The long distance you put the catheter from the valve plane, the less the gradient you have. And this is a phenomenon that we, we every know very perfectly called pressure recovery phenomenon. And the echo normally take the measure in this type, in this time where the pressure is higher and the catheter is normally calculating the pressure after the pressure was recovered. So that could be an explanation. But let's take a look what happening in Baldwin Bal. This is a trial, the first from Danny De Beer with 4,159 patients in 1555 centers in hospitals. And you can see here that one of the main reason of mortality, of more mortality, greater mortality, is smaller valves. And why is it smaller valves? We are going to see later on that is related with higher gradient. So the message, the mess, the message of this trial is: the smaller the valve, the greater the death or the events. The same of this trial of Philippe Pivarot, who is with, to, with, who is with us today. And we, we must say thank you because he, he did a lot for the science. Uh, the impact of the pre existing PPM in the survival following the aortic valve in valve procedure, he took uh, almost 90 patients with severe PPM from the vivid registry, which is more or less 8% of, of the patient. And he said that the mortality of the patient with severe prothesis patient mismatch in this field, the valve in valve, has more mortality 30 days and also one year later. And you can see here um, in this uh, adjusted to one year, the mortality in severe patient prosthesis mismatch is almost 20, 11 in moderate, and the, the, old, the, the old version of the trial said that the, the old population has almost 5% of, of, of this. So you have like four times more severe in the severe PPM uh, population. And let's take a look in this trial, which is a, a follow of three years after the partner three trial, partner two uh, registry with 
365 patients and they use Edwards XT and they said that you have a greater mortality when the, grade, when the gradient is more than 20%. This is directly linked with smaller valves, with smaller valve that has internal diameter, which is also smaller. So the, the logic of, of this trial is the smaller the valve, the smaller the internal diameter, the greater the, the residual gradient, and also the greater the mortality you have. So what we can do to avoid this type of problem? Well, we can do two things, a higher implant and also a valve fracture. Let's take a look in this model. And we try to, to explain what happened if you implant the valve in different levels. They create a simulator, a physiological simulator. They use the Perryman Edwards valve 23 millimeters and they compare these three valves. Take a look at this beautiful model. They were able to prove the valve theorem and also to measure the pressure, beautiful. They use, as we said, these three valves and different height of implant, three millimeters below the valve, six, three at the plane, three up, and seek up to the plane. And take a look at what is happening with the mean gradient. In the, in the corbal field, normally you get the more advantageous situation when it is normal, let, let's say at the level of the valve, but not with Edward. In Edward, the higher the implant, the less the gradient. The higher the implant, the less the regurgitation fraction. The higher the implant, the higher the effective orifice area. And also, the higher the implant, the less the pin wheeling index. So, the higher the valve, the better it is. And let's take this is the, the last trial I, I will show you. Let's Take a look at what happening when we fracture a valve and what we get. So they they prove these two valves, Edwards and Accurate, in a mitral flow, 19 and 21. They put the valve and then they fracture. They took pictures and measurements and take a look at how you can see that they gain space and also it happened with the accurate valve. And take a look at this area. They increased the area. They, they started with this number. Let's say the waste is this number. They increased 10%. Uh, yes, more or less 30 millimeters is more or less 20%. And also here, 20%. And the same in metro flow. So they, Put the valve and they the break the valve with 20 um with a 20 through flow and a 22 through flow through flow sorry no two through balloon 20 through balloon and 22 through balloon and they increase the area and when we took a look in the hydrodynamic function you started with a, some gradient and you decrease the gradient the the greater the volume you use, the less the gradient you gain. So here, the same. You started with some gradient, and with the volume, you, you get less gradient. So in my conclusion, aortic valve involved in a small annulus, does the final gradient matter? Well, yes, especially if you get a gradient up to 20 millimeters of mercury. And it is associated with greater number of events, of course. The smaller the prosthesis, the gradient, the residual gradient you gain, the, the greater the number of events you get, or the patient gets, sorry. And the fracture of the surgical valve and a higher implant could be a solution of the problem, especially when, it, when the, 
the valve fracturing is possible. Thank you everybody for, for paying attention to me and I am open to all the questions that you could have. Okay, Dr. Adolfo, thank you for your speech, a very didactic speech. Uh, and we are gonna do a discussion after the, the next presentation. So I'd like to, to invite now Dr. Philippe Pivaro. Dr. Philippe Pivaro is a professor at the Department of Medicine of Laval University in Canada. He's, he is also a physician of Canadian research in valvular heart disease at Quebec Heart and Lung Institute. Dr. Pivaro is going to talk about small analogs and the risk of mismatch. Uh, Dr. Pivaro has 10 minutes for his presentation. Please, Dr. Pivaro, feel free to, to make your, your speech. And thanks for that you, being with us. Okay, I hope that you see well my slides. Yeah, we can see, perfectly see your screen. Excellent, thank you very much for having me uh, today. And it's a great pleasure to share the podium with the, all these friends. Um, so I do have some disclosure to mention. We are the collab for several uh, large studies in the field of TAVR. Um, so first we need to define what is process patient mismatch. So Adolfo very well uh, explained what it is. It's a prosthesis that is functioning normally, such as this one, you, the leaflet are thin and well moving. Uh, there is no dysfunction, no stenosis, but still um, there is a high ratio gradient because the prostate valve AOA, effective orifice area, is too small for the patient body size. And, and so the definition of a prosthesis patient mismatch in the recent VOC3 document is defined as a moderate when the index defective orifice area is lower than 0.85 and CV when it is less than 0.65. However, in obese people with BMI more than 30, the VOC3 recommends to use lower cut point of index AOA, so 0.70 for moderate and 0.55 for CV. And the consequence of mismatch, one of the consequence, the hemodynamic consequence is the persistence of high ratio gradient, which is defined in VOC3 as a main gradient more than 20. So now we need to define what is the small analyst because we talk about small aortic analysts. Well, um, I'm showing here the most frequently used definition. Uh, generally it's a aortic uh, analyst diameter equal or less than 21 millimeter by echo or less than 23 millimeter by CT because CT and echo, we know that echo measures smaller diameter compared to CT. Or if you want to uh, express this in perimeter, this is generally an aortic annulus perimeter less than 70 or 75, let's say 72. This is one of the most frequently used definition or aortic annulus area less than 400. So if we look at the predictors of mismatch, well, <clears throat> you have some patient related factors, older age, female sex, diabetes, renal failure, hypertension as well that I did not mention here. Very important and of course it, it is expected larger body size, larger body surface area. And you also have small aortic analysis. Indeed, it comes out in several surgical studies, especially surgical uh, SAVR studies, maybe a bit less in, in TAVR series, and also small prostate valve size. So I would say, well, small prostate valve size or female sex indirectly are marker for small aortic analysis. So this is an important risk factor. And then there are maybe more procedure or process related factors. Um, SAVR versus TAVR, indeed, there are several studies suggesting uh, uh, that there's more mismatch, severe mismatch with SAVR than with TAVR. Within SAVR, uh, you tend to have more mismatch with bioprosthesis versus mechanical valves. And well, in the TAVR uh, field, uh, generally there is much more severe mismatch with the valve in valve versus native or de novo TAVR. And uh, as Adolfo mentioned, there's also studies suggesting that you have uh, more mismatch with the valve expandable versus the self expanding valve in TAVR. Um, so, having said that, I think it is important to keep in mind, and Adolfo uh, touched to that before, and it's very important that mismatch as assessed by the index TOA measured by ECHO uh, may be overestimated. 
Why? Because there are several factors. You may underestimate the LVOT diameter and thus the effective office area by echo. LVOT diameter is really a challenging uh, measure to, to do. And uh, um, the other uh, phenomenon that has been mentioned by Adolfo is a possible overestimation of gradient and therefore underestimation of the AOA uh, because of pressure recovery. Because I think we have to, I think one of the take home message today is that echo and catheter do not measure the same thing. They do not measure the gradient and AOA at the same level in the circulatory system. So a Doppler echo will measure gradients and AOA where they are the worst, so at the level of the vena contracta. Well, catheter is measuring a few centimeters downstream in the aorta. So uh, it takes into account the pressure recovery that occurs downstream of the vena contracta. So that's why the gradient are systematically lower with catheter versus um, versus echo. Uh, also obesity, as previously mentioned, because if we use the index AOA in obese people, we may over-index the AOA and therefore overestimate the mismatch. And that's why the VAC3 recommended to use lower cut point of index AOA in this patient. And also the last but not the least is low flow state, because following TAVI, up to 35, 40% of patients post TAVI, they are in low flow state. And so you may have a pseudo severe mismatch, just the same as we have in the um, low EF, low flow, low gradient AS, native AS, where we may have a pseudo severe stenosis, same here. So uh, true severe PPM may be overestimated because of this phenomenon. And well, this is here um, a study from Amor Abbas um, that is uh, submitted uh, um, uh, showing actually that you see this difference, the systematic difference between echo in red, red box versus catheterization, um, where the uh, gradients by, by, uh, by uh, echo uh, are systematically larger than those by, by cat. And this is even more, um, I should say, pronounced and important in the uh, smaller valve, in the smaller annulus, you see, especially the balloon expandable valve. This is maybe where we have uh, the uh, most important discordance between uh, cat and echo with regard to the measurement of gradients, where by echo in the small balloon expandable valve, you have relatively high gradients, whereas by catheterization, you have almost zero. So I think this is important to keep in mind, and this is in large part due to the, again, the pressure recovery phenomenon. So to kind of overcome this limitation, um, investigators have used different methods to measure PPM, um, in, in, in the literature, the, the one that is often used is, as we discussed until now, the AOA measured by echo uh, in the patient. So this is the AOA using the continuity equation. We index for body size, and then we have the indexed AOA, and then we can classify the mismatch. But there is also another method that is the predicted index. So here, no measure. We do not measure the AOA directly. We use the normal reference value of AOA for the model and size of prosthesis and divide by BSA. So for example, in this case, we have a sapient tree size 23. The normal reference value according to the collabs um, uh, is 1.45. So we divide by the BSA and we got a predicted index AOA that is 0.72. And you see that in this patient, the use of the predicted index AOA would reclassify the patient from a severe to moderate mismatch. And the predicted index AOA, I think one of the advantages is that it is less prone to overestimate the mismatch because of pressure recovery, because of measurement errors, because of hemodynamics, because it is independent of all this. So um, this is a summary of the studies and, and Adolfo already showed several of them. Um, so the, the, this, the first I want to show here, there are large, uh, studies in SAVR, one meta-analysis published that we published in 2012. Um, and uh, another one is the STS registry, uh, huge number of patients. And, and actually, um, uh, in, in the meta-analysis uh, and, and the STS registry, actually, uh, in, and in most SAVR studies to date, the method that we used to define mismatch was the predicted index theory. So maybe a more stringent definition of mismatch. And with this definition, you got about 10% severe mismatch with uh, association with increased mortality and rehospitalization. 
in the server in the in the in the in the following uh, studies here um, these are the randomized trials that compared saver versus taver uh, so you have the partner one you have the coval virus you have the partner two a you have the partner three all these studies use the measured index theory so again keep in mind that the mismatch may be overestimated and that's why you see that the uh, incidence of severe mismatch was pretty high especially in the saver harm um, uh, but even in the Tavar arm, in some of the studies, you may be surprised that, uh, well, we have such a high prevalence of severe mismatch, such as partner one, we have 20% in Tavar, 28% in Tavar arm. This is again because we use the measured index theory, and you have a lot of patients with low flow state, so we may have a lot of patients with pseudo severe PTS. Having said that, these trials generally show that you have much less severe mismatch with Tavar than with Tavar, and this is randomized. Um, except in partner three, where actually the incidence of mismatch was low with no difference in both harms. Now, with regard to the association with outcome, well, there are some inconsistency depending on the, um, on the trial, but what we generally saw is that there was a significant association between severe mismatch and outcomes, clinical outcomes in the SAVR arm, uh, especially in partner one and partner two A, but not in the TAVR arm. Maybe because there is less mismatch, maybe because it is less severe, maybe because it is more overestimated. Um, and finally, in these um, three last studies, these are registries, okay? And um, this is the TVT registry that Adolfo showed from O.R. Derman. Um, and there is also a more recent study by Tang and colleagues, but was focused on the self-expanding. And what we see here is that um, uh, all these studies use the measured index theory, and there is 12% uh, in the TVT by Howard Ehrman, 5.2% severe mismatch. Uh, in, in, in the initial study by Howard Ehrman, there was a significant association with, with outcomes, although the hazard ratio was modest. In that by Tang, more recently, there was much less severe mismatch with no association with outcomes. And then there is one that is focused on a small annulus that I will uh, describe uh, later. This is a, the recent study that we published, um, uh, uh, and this is um, the partner 2A trial and S3I, so I means both, and terminate a registry. Um, and in this study, we use both definition methods, so the measured and the um, predicted index theory. And the summary is that um, the incidence of severe mismatch, again, is markedly lower when you use the predicted uh, index theory versus the measured. And this is in both arms, SAVR and TAVR. And regardless of the method used, the incidence of severe mismatch was always uh, much lower in TAVR versus SAVR. Now, with regard to the impact on outcomes, well, in SAVR, yes, severe mismatch by the predicted index theory method, which we, we believe is the most accurate, is rare, but is nonetheless independently associated with worse outcomes. So when it occurs, it has an impact on outcome. When it's true severe PPM, it has an impact on outcome. In TAVR, actually, severe PPM by the predicted index theory was virtually absent, was close to zero, and so, of course, no impact on outcomes. And this is why, you know, in a recent editorial, I, I put these slides together and say, well, with the improvement in the valve hemodynamics, with the hemodynamic performance in the surgical bioprostic valve, and with the introduction of TAVR that has much less PPM, well, my hope, and I think it's becoming a reality, is that mismatch will become obsolete soon and we'll not have to discuss <laughs> this topic. Um, um, but it, we are not, um, I think, uh, yet there. Uh, there is still the issue of this patient with small annulus, and this is the the study that we did in partner 1A with my good friend uh, and colleague, Josette rodes cabau And you see, when we compared TAVR versus SAVR, according to the tertile of analyst size, you see that in all groups, uh, large analysts, medium analysts, small analysts, there is always uh, less mismatch with TAVR than with SAVR, but the difference is much more important in the small annulus. This is really where there is a big difference. Why? Because with, uh, with smaller annulus, you see um, an exponential increase in the incidence of severe mismatch in SAVR, but not necessarily uh, to the same extent in TAVR. And, and so 
But surprisingly, when we look at the impact and outcomes, well, there was at least a strong trend for higher mortality with SAVR versus TAVR in the small analyst third time. Whereas in the medium analyst third time, it was neutral. And in the large analyst, maybe the opposite. And this was believed to be due to the fact that uh, in counterpart to a mismatch, there was a higher paravav leak, of course, in, in TAVR versus SAVR, especially in the large analyst third time. So this is a summarize here saying, well, with mismatch clearly in the server series, as soon as you get into the small analyst, you see a very uh, exponential increase in the risk of mismatch and, and true severe mismatch. Whereas with TAVR, TAVR is more forgiven in terms of it performed surprisingly, that was not my, my expectation initially, but it performed very well, hemodynamically speaking, in terms of gradient and zero ways, even in the small analyst. On the other hand, I think we have to keep in mind, and you know, uh, Adolfo discussed the maybe the disagreement that we have, uh, you know, between different type of valve self expanding versus balloon expandable in terms of mismatch gradients. But on the other hand, maybe uh, uh, better outcomes um, with balloon expandable. Well, I think we have to keep in mind that one important component of the equation is the paravalve leak. You may have less mismatch, less higher residual gradient, but if you have more paravalve leak, this will have probably a more important impact on outcomes. So have a small registry. So in this registry, they only use self-expandable, but there was two types, the intraannular and supraannular design. And this were in a patient with a small annually. And, um, and interestingly, here you have 9.4% severe mismatch. Uh, the predictors of severe mismatch were essentially um, the intraannular design versus supraannular. So intraannular had more uh, mismatch, which makes sense. And post dilation was associated with less mismatch. This has been reported by several studies. And when mismatch occurred in this study was independently associated with a uh, higher risk of mortality. Uh, the epitome of the small analyst, I would say, is of course the valve in valve in a failed surgical valve. And Adolfo already mentioned the study that we looked in the vivid registry, where actually we found that patient with a, a, a pre existing severe mismatch of the failed surgical bioprostata uh, at higher mortality. Uh, because here there is not much you can do. You are in a very, uh, let's say, hostile anatomic environment. You have a very small analyst to start with, and you do a valve in valve, you know, you, you, you can only worsen the situation, the hemodynamic situation, and therefore the clinical situation. Now, uh, and this is one of my last slides, but it is very important to keep in mind that we have to uh, look, I think, uh, more into the future. Of course, we are always very interested by the short-term impact of hemodynamics, of mismatch on one year, two year mortality, but let's have a window of more 10 years. And in this regard, we have to pay attention that small aortic analysts will be associated with higher stress, more pinwheeling, uh, especially with uh, following TAVR. And that leaflet mechanical stress is the main determinant of structural valve deterioration by a prostate valve. This has been very well shown in, in SAVR series. Furthermore, smaller aortic analysts, as we showed, is associated with higher risk of severe mismatch. And in turn, several studies have shown that severe mismatch has residual graded are associated with increased risk of SVD following SAVR. So it's a double trouble here. And uh, this is um, an in vitro study that we did some years ago, where actually you see that with a smaller Arctic analyst, and when you do a TAVR, and especially if there is more oversizing, uh, you will have more bending stress. You see this picture of the free, uh, free margin of the leaflet um, during systole and during diastole, well, at the end of the systole, you will see this pinwheeling that we have. This means more mechanical stress. And this mechanical stress that we see here uh, very obviously in vitro is repeated billion of time in vivo. Uh, this is a no brainer. This will translate for probably in shorter durability. So uh, my point is that when you have a small analyst, you have uh, uh, generally more mismatch, more severe mismatch. You also have often more only more oversizing, therefore more under deployment of the valve. This all means more mechanical stress and potentially less durability. So in conclusion, 
Um, a small uptick analyst is associated with high risk of severe mismatch and therefore high risk dual gradient, but also keep in mind, this means more mechanical stress on the leaflets most likely, and also higher flow turbulence. That's all risk factors for long-term durability. Severe mismatch is less frequent following TAVA versus SAVA. Uh, when you compare, you know, uh, similar generation, uh, this is quite obvious from several randomized trials. Um, and, and this is particularly true when you get into the small analysts, the more hostile anatomy. Um, and, and small analysts and, and severe mismatch or severe mismatch and or may, be negat may, may negatively impact valve durability uh, following AVR. So there are some ongoing RCTs, randomized trials to compare TAVR versus SAVR. In the small analysts, there is a VIVA trial Joseph prodes cabal is the PI for this trial, and this is ongoing, and the recruitment is doing well. And there is also another one that is like a, let's say, I would say a partner tree trial, but in women only. Women mean, of course, smaller Arctic analysts. And this is the REA trial that is conducted in Europe and also um, uh, progressing well in terms of recruitment. So we'll see what will be the results of this trial. And I thank you very much for your attention. Muchas gracias. Thank, Thank you, you, Dr. Dr. Pivarot, for this please. amazing presentation. Thank you. Thank you. We have uh, uh, a short time for a small discussion. I want to uh, ask to Adolfo. Uh, Adolfo, what you, you present two strategies, is the higher implant and the post dilatation. What about the overfilling of the balloon in, in, in this case of valve in bulk. What do you think it is a, it's, it's a valid strategy? Well, that could be if you break the valve before. So if you have a, the, valve, the, the surgical valve fracture, then an overfill, overfilling the valve, the, the new valve, the main balloon is palmable valve, you can get more room inside the surgical valve. Uh, Philip said, and I, I, I also tried to mention, the post dilatation in this scenario can make the difference. So if you end up with higher gradient and, and you do a post dilatation, you for sure is, I, I, no, for sure no, but probably you're, you are going to, to end up with less gradient. Uh, so my, my normal strategy is to break the valve and then to put the new valve, balloon expandable, let's say, overfilling always to try to get the, the, the more room I, I could. Yeah, no, I think okay. a stent fracture could have pros and cons, eh? because if we fracture the stent, we may have, as Adolfo mentioned, we may have a more uh, deployed, uh, completely deployed valve and therefore better hemodynamics, less mechanical stress. Um, but on the other end, if you do a stent fracture post uh, TAVI implant, you may potentially damage the leaflets there. There are some interesting data from the group of uh, David uh, uh, in sample showing that it may, it may cause lesion to the leaflets, you know, when you do this post. If you can do it pre, but it, it, it has some issues as well because you may cause uh, CVRR and you may have to react very rapidly. Um, uh, but so there are pros and cons. So we don't know yet what would be the consequence of a stent fracture and durability. Uh, if it is performed pre, there is good chances that it may improve durability. If it is performed post, I'm not sure, you know, what would be the risk versus benefit ratio in terms of durability. The other thing we have to pay attention when we do a postulation or stent fracturing, is not to, let's say, over delay the valve because, um, you know, I mentioned uh, undersizing and so uh, oversizing and therefore under deployment may cause some pinwheeling and mechanical stress. But if you have over expansion, this will cause also increased mechanical stress. It's a different type of stress. It's not bending stress, it's more tethering stress, but it's not good either, right? And this has been shown also in vitro by the group uh, in sample Vancouver too. But Dr. Pibado, in your in your press, in your experience in small surgical valves, uh, do you perform the the crack of the valve? Is your preference to, to perform the crack 
before or after the implantation uh, and you decide to, to perform the, the, the crack after the, the implantation of the tower uh, based on the, the gradient, echo gradient or the transcatheter gradient? Well, this is a very good point. I think our practice has evolved. I would say we were more aggressive with stent fracturing uh, in, in the early days. We are less and less now. Uh, why? Because we, uh, we systematically, uh, interventional cardiologists will systematically corroborate the echo gradient with an invasive measurement. And I think David will, will, will talk about this. I think it's extremely important because sometimes you have quite high gradient by echo especially in the valve in valve within surgical, paid surgical valve, but then you look with catheter and there is not much gradient. And then you should probably not crack the valve because any additional procedure you do, of course there is some benefit, but there is a price to pay. Uh, and, and so I think we should use this uh, additional uh, procedure uh, wisely. And when we do it, I should say, well, for now our interventional cardiologists, they tend to do it, uh, try to do it pre uh, in some selected cases, but for practical reason, when they decide to do it, but again, it's less and less frequent, they do it more after indeed. Dr. Enrique and Dr. Dave would like to, to make some comments about this, this subject. I'm going to agree with my uh, wise colleague, Philippe. I'm on holiday, but when you guys invited me to join, how could I say no? So. My next talk, 10 minutes, will basically be on this entire topic. So there you go. Okay, okay. Could I, could I make a question to Philip? Dr. Pivaro, you, you mentioned the, the paper from Rebecca and your paper, where the, you predict the valve area and you compare this with the measure. But when you set this, predict measure, you use the same formula to, to calculate the valve area. I, I, I am right or not? Yes, you're absolutely right. So I think what it does is that the, um, uh, so first the predicted index stay away for, uh, we proposed this method uh, with my colleague and friend Jean Duménil like uh, close to 30 years ago. And then it has been used extensively in the surgical literature using the same principle, you know, we. Uh, of course, you need to have a reliable source for your normal reference airways. Uh, that's the key. Um, and that's why we published this paper uh, with Becky to provide some normal reference value. But you're right. I mean, to some extent, these normal reference values are derived from echo where we use the continuity equation. Uh, the good thing, however, is that this will all call up adjudicated. So really pay attention to try to avoid the different measurement pitfalls. I do not mean that they, we have none and we are still subject to low flow state, et cetera. The other thing is what it does is that you take the average of the normal reference value. So it, it, it avoids, you know, the viability and the cases where you have a, a pseudo severization of the AOA because of a low flow state, because then instead of using the measured index, the way you're gonna use the, the more the, 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 the predicted that provides you, I think a better idea and more accurate estimate of what you would get, because typically you will see the airway that you measured in the patient will be smaller than the predicted one, because often the patient is in low flow state. I think the predicted index airway provides you a more an estimate of what you would get if you would do a dobutamine stress echo to the patient, in order to normalize the flow and see what is real the the, the real airway that the prosthesis can really gives you, you know. So that's, uh, I think the predicted in a way is more like a, an hemodynamic fingerprint of the valve. Dr. Pibaro, uh, you talk about the, the severe mismatch can impact in the durability of the, 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 the valve, the prosthesis. And what about the thrombosis? Have you seen more cases of thrombosis and we will have severe mismatch of the valve or there are, there are there, there is no relation between mismatch and the throm thrombosis in your, in your experience, or is it difficult to say something about this stuff? Well, I think we don't have yet enough data in sufficient number of patients because, you know, for subclinical thrombosis or thrombosis, you know, the, fortunately, the numbers are relatively, uh, clinical thrombosis, they are small. Um, and subclinical thrombosis, we don't have much data. We have those from the CT sub-study in the partner tree and evolutorist. 
um, uh, which unfortunately is, a, well, fortunately, unfortunately or fortunately a, a series of patients where we don't have much severe mismatch. But yes, indeed, I think there are some indirect evidence that you have association between severe mismatch, high residual gradients, abnormal flow patterns, and thrombosis. And also, I would like to say that if you have thrombosis, there are some uh, evidence now, growing evidence that this may predispose to faster degeneration of the valve. So there is, I think, a continuum, you know, like if you have suboptimal hemodynamics, mechanical stress, flow pattern, uh, this may predispose to thrombosis and, and, and then eventually thrombosis, subclinical or clinical, even if successfully treated, may cause inflammation at the level of the valve and this may predispose to faster degeneration. We've seen several patients having subclinical thrombosis or clinical thrombosis that were treated with warfarin or successfully, and then develop earlier, very early calcific degeneration than after. So I'm sure there is a, um, there is a continuum, there is a, a link between all these factors. You know, they cannot be independent. They are interrelated, I think. Thank you, thank you. We, we have to continue with the, with the next speaker. Uh, the next speaker is the Dr. David Wood. Uh, probably some uh, uh, a speaker about TABI in young patient, coronary access and valve durability. The Dr. Doug Wood is a professor of medicine of the Division of Cardiology in University of British Columbia, director of the Center of Cardiovascular Innovation, head of the Division of the Cardiology in Vancouver. He's a really important person. Please, Dr. Wood. Hello, my friends. Look at this wonderful group. I love it. You can see my slides, okay? Yeah. I'm yes, going to give we can see. a really practical 10 minute talk and then um, we'll go from there. Then I might have to have some wine. I'd much rather um, be uh, down there with you and uh, hopefully soon again. Um, coronary access and valve durability. And I'm presenting this on behalf of John Webb, Janar Sadhanathan all of the complete Tavern Discordance Tavern investigators. So for those that just um, were involved in well, ACC and then TVT, um, there's some amazing techniques with tall and short frame valves, amazing um, innovation with regard to paravalvular leak, getting the pacemaker rate down into the single digits for many platforms now. But really, to me, the only word that resonates in 2021 is repeatability. So you put your valve in whatever platform, can you repeat it, especially as we move into younger and younger patients, or more importantly, patients with longer longevity. And so really, that's what this talk is about. You do a valve in a 70 year old or a 75 year old. What is the coronary access? And do you have a strategy for redo TAVR or revalving. There's all sorts of different buzzwords around the world right now. But this word, if, uh, if nothing else comes out of the next 10 minutes, it's all about repeatability. So first we'll talk about coronary access, then we'll talk about durability. And uh, as Philippe knows, obviously the passion now is understanding the hemodynamics, the invasive versus the uh, echo derived and how we should be treating our patients. It, it all comes back to the patient. You have a patient, can you access their coronaries after you put in the THV platform? You have a patient, they're gonna need another TAVR at some point. I know there's lots of discussion about do some valves last longer than others? We're participating in the SMART trial, looking at hemodynamics, echo derived, because it's a, you know, John and I wanna help solve that issue. But really those are the two big questions. Coronary access, and if you have to do a redo TAVR procedure, what platform are you gonna use? And when are you going to decide to do that repeat procedure? So these are some slides from ACC. I think there's only five or six. Um, it depends where you are in the world. And again, I know many of you speak and proctor all over the world as well. Um, it's already the dominant therapy. Um, but the question is where that lands. Is it going to be 80% of all patients? Is it going to be 75%, 85%? We know coronary disease is common depending on the risk profile anywhere from 17 to 80% actually, and up to one in 10 are going to require TAVI um, in the first couple of years after the platform goes in. And we expect this to increase 
as we do studies in lower risk patients and as we start implanting in patients with more longevity in their early 70s. And we heard about some very exciting low risk studies in very young patients coming out of Lars's group, uh, which I think will inform <laughs> practice significantly. Um, the coronary artery disease prevalence is based on risk. On average, about half the time, this was a wonderful review by uh, Joseph and his group, um, are going to have coronary disease, never been core lab uh, adjudicated, which I know Philippe and myself and others are huge fans of, and um, no look at the residual or the mean uh, syntax score. We know uh, in the trials about one in 10 with concomitant revascularization, but uh, very low when you look at the low risk uh, Evolute trials as well as the partner trials. The benefits from revascularization are unknown. So whether you decide to revascularize these patients before, during, or after TAVR, we clearly don't have a signal. Um, we think there might be benefit, but we don't know. There's equipoise. We have the activation trial, which um, unfortunately was took a long time to recruit in very small numbers. So, uh, and again, included patients with prior surgical revascularization that kind of made it a little bit more difficult to interpret. We have a nice paper from this year telling us that the door to balloon time with a fourfold higher PCI failure rate when you have patients with prior THV platform. So, and then Marco Brabanti, one of our former fellows, published this paper. This was talked extensively at um, TVT. As you know, I think, goodness, half the cases involve coronary access and strategies and all of that at TVT. Uh, so we know that coronary access is going to be significant after TAVI. And I think all of us doing procedures frequently have had cases where both short and tall frame platforms have come back and it was very challenging to access the coronaries. And Janar Sadhanathan, one of my new hires, is doing a, a wonderful study done looking at can access, systematically accessing these platforms with core lab adjudication, CT pre and post. That will give us some very nice um, information. But I think the big question is when you're putting in that first THV platform, looking at the CT carefully, doing a careful angiogram after you put the THV platform in, is there going to be an issue with access? And we know we have all sorts of tips and tricks for commissural alignment. We have some next generation valves that will publicly be available in the next couple of years looking at these strategies, but this is a huge issue. And uh, I'll get back to it, but we'll circle back to in about three minutes to complete TAVR because we think it's going to access the question about whether you should or should not treat the coronaries after you put the THV platform in, but also about coronary access specifically in a short frame valve, which I think will give a lot of us um, a nice warm feeling in 2026 when we can show hopefully that most of the time in the 2000 patients randomized to stage stenting, um, coronary access is not a huge issue, or if it is, that there's tips and tricks to mitigate it. Now durability, and this has become a passion for John and I since, I guess, early last year, Philippe, when we connected with Ammer and yourself and realized that this data is not new. Philippe and others from Ammer have been working on this for many, many years, but it became very real to John and I when we saw people um, treating or not treating valves based on echo-derived gradients and they'd see a gradient of 32 and they bring the patient back for a redilatation in late follow-up or do a redo TAVR. And uh, it just didn't make sense when it seemed like these valves otherwise were working appropriately. So two cases that highlight the lack of association between indirect invasive gradients and echo derived gradients. And there is no mathematical formula to correct for this. These are two extreme cases and I'll chat about a study called Discordance TAVR that we're enrolling in. But here, case from Vancouver, 83, 20 millimeter Sapien 3, moderate COPD, so other reasons for having some mild shortness of breath after we did the THV. Uh, at one month, 19 millimeters of mercury on echo. At one year, 47 millimeters of mercury. And I'll be honest, at this point, John and I had got to a place where we were not doing on-table echoes, simultaneous on-table transthoracic echoes on most patients. And we were not doing meticulous invasive gradients on most patients. So when this patient was referred back a year later with a gradient of 47, luckily we'd had discussions with Ammer and Philippe, and we did an invasive gradient using meticulous technique, two pigtails, 
down deep in the LV, no ectopy, three measurements, getting the mean, sending the data in to our core lab now. We have a hemodynamic core lab that can interpret data from all 126 complete TAVR sites. The invasive gradient is 21. And the key point here is we'd already done a CT scan to show there was no valve thrombosis or any mischief with the leaflet. Another patient here you can see, 89 TAVR in 2014. So a long time ago, 23 millimeter XT, again, a CT showing no halt or valve thrombosis. Gradient looked fine four years later, but now you can see the gradient's 42. And this time we bring the patient back and the invasive gradient was 41. So we ended up doing a valve and valve. But again, as you recall from the first case, both of them had gradients in the 40s. One, the invasive gradient was right at the cusp of what you might consider abnormal. And we're just gonna continue to follow, realizing there's a discordance between the echo gradient and the invasive gradient. And this one, we felt it was appropriate to do treatment. And again, the treatment, we could talk about this and we had a nice talk from Adolfo about late cracking or fracture. We often fracture post if we're gonna do it. But um, I must say, since we started doing more meticulous on table echoes with invasive gradients, our uh, fracture rate has decreased. What is discordance? I think this has been highlighted by many. Amor is now a close co collaborator but we know that there can be a significant difference between your echo derived gradient and your invasive gradient. Um, I'll go through all of these, but before you put a valve in on this side, there is a beautiful concordance between echo and invasive gradients. I think for all the implanters on this um, wonderful conference, there is no disconnect there. There's no need to do meticulous invasive hemodynamics if you've got an echo showing that the mean gradient is 45 and the valve area is 0.7. I think we know that that is severe aortic stenosis. But once you put a valve in, and this is not new, whether it's a transcatheter valve or a surgical valve, it is very hard to predict the relationship between invasive gradient and echo derived. And Amer has two papers accepted to CERC intervention that will be coming out, I think, shortly, uh, Philippe, I believe. So this is the algorithm that we came up with last year. You have a patient with a short frame, a tall frame valve, it doesn't matter. You've got a mean gradient greater than 20 on echo, or they meet VARC-3 criteria, and Philippe just highlighted that for stage two hemodynamic valve deterioration. We get a CT scan on all of them, and I can tell you after chatting with many people all around the world, that seems to be now the accepted next step. You've got an echo gradient that's elevated, you do a CT. If there's valve thrombosis, you're gonna put them on anticoagulation, and to your point, I think they might be on a different trajectory, and there might be worsening durability. We'll have to see what comes out in the wash. But if not, we bring them back for invasive hemodynamics with an on-table echo. If the two line up, like in that uh, second case, we might do a valve and valve or a late redilatation. But if they don't, and this is crucial, we think that those patients do not require any further intervention. And unfortunately, we've seen re-intervention in patients that perhaps did not need it. And I think that's why this became so clinically important for our group in Vancouver. Um, this has now uh, been reviewed. We're just doing the response to reviewers and CERC intervention. 13 of our pilot study last year all had a mean gradient greater than 20, or five met VARC-3 criteria for moderate valve dysfunction. When we brought them back for invasive hemodynamics and an on-table echo, um, nine had a mean invasive gradient less than 20, four stayed the same. But here's the important part. If you use the invasive gradient versus the echo derived, as well as the other parameters that uh, Philippe highlighted, um, if you substitute in the invasive gradient, you end up with normal valve function. So two prospective studies in my last minute here. Complete TAVR, 4,000 patients. Discordance TAVR, 50 patients. Complete TAVR, we won't have the data until 2026, but it will be very compelling both for coronary, whether we should revascularize those arteries, as well as whether coronary access is an issue with a short frame valve. You can see that from the logo and discordance TAVR, 11 sites, 50 patients. We're trying to get all of this data done so that we can submit it as a late breaker for a London valve in November. And hopefully we'll meet that threshold September 7th is the cutoff. And we have 22 um, cases so far at the 11 sites. So complete TAVR started out looking at complete revascularization, but it's now complete hemodynamic assessment because to me, this is the crucial questions for repeatability. I won't go through this in detail. This is available all over the place and on clinicaltrials.gov, but 4,000 patients, they have successful transfemoral TAVR with a balloon expandable valve. 
All of them have at least a 70% visual angiographic stenosis. We use the same criteria that Shamir Mehta and I did for the complete study in a 2.5 millimeter vessel, no FFR, IFR, or anything like that. 2,000 medical therapy, 2,000 come back for staged PCI within 45 days. Everything core lab adjudicated, CT, echo, hemodynamic, and angiographic. So we can clearly see if there's any issue with a short frame valve with repeat recanalization. And then here's the key part. All 4,000 have standardized invasive hemodynamics with an on-table echo at the beginning. And if at any time during the median three and a half year follow-up, maximum five year, they have elevated gradients or meet moderate uh, VARC-3 hemodynamic valve deterioration, they come back for a repeat assessment. So we're gonna be able to tie this to hard clinical outcomes, death, MI, ischemia-driven revask, rehospitalization. Uh, so yes, we're aiming for all 4,000 to be enrolled by April of 2024 with the presentation and publication in the fall of 2026. And we already have 22 different sub-studies within this piece, and there'll be a coronary primary endpoint as well as a hemodynamic primary endpoint. And 126 sites in um, the US and Canada. And then Discordance Taver, I don't have the map, but there's 11 sites we've enrolled. I believe it's 22 or 26 of the 50. We're trying to get it fully enrolled. And this is any patient who's had TAVR in the last 10 years with an echo gradient over 20 or meets VARC3 criteria for hemodynamic valve deterioration coming back after a CT to exclude valve thrombosis and HALT for hemodynamics on table echo. And I think this will be incredibly provocative on top of the pilot study that hopefully will come out in CERC intervention in the next couple of months. So finally, uh, I'll leave you just with that one word. Whatever we're doing in 2021, whatever platform you use, I think all of us, it behooves us to think about repeatability because um, we really need to think about how are we going to access the coronaries? How are we going to revalve or do redo TAVR on that patient? There's obviously new technology coming, looking at leaflets and other things to make this hopefully easier for implanting physicians. But um, really, this to me should now be the focus in the aortic space Never mind mitral tricuspid and all the other fun things we do um, for our group. So thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Dave, for your speech, an excellent speech. And we have in the final of the sessions some minutes to discuss some details of this, this excellent, this very interesting topic. Now we're going to have the final presentation. Uh, so I'd like to invite Dr. Enrique Ribeiro, my colleague here in Brazil. Dr. Enrique is an interventional cardiologist. Uh, he works in the INCOR, uh, Samaritano Hospital, Sirio Libanese, and Germany Hospital here in Sao Paulo. And he made his fellowship and doctorate at the University of Laval in Quebec. Dr. Eric is going to talk, talk about highly calcified by cuspid aortic stenosis, plenty and results. Please, Dr. Eric, feel free to, to make your speech. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mangioni. Uh, thank you for Edwards Life Science for being able to, you know, uh, have such a, a prestigious uh, uh, colleagues, you know, Dr. Felipe Barro apart from uh, a great uh, friend, has been a, a great mentor for me, together with uh, Josep and David. Also, uh, we have made a lot of contributions together. So for me, it's a great honor to be uh, with uh, such uh, good friends. And uh, we are really uh, behind the schedule. So I'll try to be uh, brief, uh, discussing some you know, very important aspects uh, regarding bicuspid uh, valve. First of all, is that uh, while uh, we're treating, you know, patients with uh, less age, of course, the incidence of bicuspid valve is going to increase. So uh, many challenges and important aspects should be uh, evaluated in such uh, patients. And of course, uh, uh, apart from, you know, sizing, THV expansion, paravalvular leak, pacemaker, uh, ascending aorta uh, dilatation. So many, you know, different challenges for TAVR in such patients with bicuspid aortic valve. In addition to the fact that after more than 13 years, uh, 10, uh, nine to 10 trials, 
and uh, more than 8,000 patients randomized. Uh, really, uh, no study to date has evaluated in a randomized fashion the bis bicuspid aortic valve. So uh, this is an important aspect, and uh, many of the data we have comes from uh, registries uh, worldwide. And regarding the clinical outcomes in, in such patients, uh, uh, the initial series with the first generation uh, uh, balloon and self-expandable valves have shown uh, uh, very high uh, rates of uh, complications uh, in such patients with, with a very high uh, rate of uh, the need for pacemaker, moderate to CVAR, and even uh, death. Uh, however, uh, recent data from the STS uh, registry with uh, uh, almost uh, 170,000 patients uh, included in this uh, registry, more than 5,000 procedures in bicuspid valve have shown that uh, with the newer generation valves, in special in this registry, uh, more than 70 percent of the patients use the sapien uh, tree valve. We have seen an improvement in device success within the last you know, uh, a few years with this uh, current uh, generation uh, devices. Uh, so that uh, nowadays, uh, when compared by cuspid versus uh, tricuspid valve, uh, the, the, the success of the procedure is pretty similar between uh, both uh, arms. Also, uh, with uh, respect to the uh, sapien tree, the balloon expandable valve, uh, recently, uh, actually two years ago, Raj uh, Makar published in JAMA with uh, many other colleagues, uh, this very important registry with uh, more than 2,600 bicuspid patients uh, treated with the sapien tree. Uh, and these uh, patients will, were compared using a propensity score matching with more than 25 covariates uh, uh, re with regards to the tricuspid using the same valve, the Sapien-3. Uh, it's important to highlight that in, in this uh, uh, paper, the mean age was uh, 74 and the mean STS of uh, 4.9, uh, suggesting uh, pretty uh, more intermediate risk uh, patients. And it's very uh, important to see in this publication, uh, this is really the best uh, results we have seen until that uh, in 2019 uh, in the TAVR field uh, treating bicuspid patients. So uh, the rate of stroke was very small and see, uh, a little bit higher as compared to the tricuspid, but uh, low rates and also pacemaker within the single digit uh, range with a very low uh, mortality rates and other complications such as uh, bleeding and major vascular uh, complications. In addition, uh, we have seen, especially for the Sapien XT valve, uh, somewhat increased uh, rate of annulus rupture and conversion uh, to open heart surgery. And for sure, uh, with the Sapien tree, the commander uh, that is more flexible, uh, we have seen an improvement in, in such uh, 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 endpoints. Uh, however, uh, still in this uh, study, there was a slightly uh, a higher rate of both uh, 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 conversion to uh, open heart surgery and annulus rupture as compared to the tricuspid valve, but still a very low uh, rates uh, in addition to the need for a second valve. Uh, more recently, uh, just uh, presented uh, recently uh, during the EuroPCR, uh, the same authors uh, presented in this very interesting study uh, uh, by cuspid only in those patients with an STS less than 3%, meaning uh, a very low risk uh, population uh, with a by cuspid. And even though uh, this has been in, introduced in the, uh, in the guidelines recently. Uh, there were uh, 3,100 uh, patients uh, at low risk uh, with a bicuspid that were, uh, again, compared uh, using 29 covariates using propensity score matching uh, with a, a tricuspid tricuspid valve. The primary endpoint was death and stroke at 30 days and one year, and a uh, very important uh, secondary endpoints were also evaluated. And in this uh, important study, as you can see here, 
when adjusted for uh, the, the covariates, there was no difference in a procedure and uh, in hospital outcomes with a very low rates of conversion to open heart surgery, annulus rupture, and other uh, important uh, clinical endpoints, including mortality and stroke. And in the follow-up, the mean follow-up of 12 months, uh, as you can see here, uh, even uh, uh, for the bicuspid, death rate was even uh, lower as compared to the tri tricuspid valve. Uh, and also stroke rates were uh, similar in the one year uh, follow-up. And with uh, regards to uh, a death rate, uh, after score, uh, propensity score matching. Again, there was really no difference in death and stroke between both groups, showing that even in such uh, low risk patients, uh, uh, the Sapien 3 uh, produced a very uh, important uh, result. Uh, more recently, uh, in this uh, same STS uh, registry, Dr. Uh, Forrest just uh, uh, presented and published last year uh, the comparison of uh, Evolute R and, and Pro in such patients with uh, bicuspid versus a tricuspid valve. Uh, the number of patients were a little bit smaller, uh, a little less than 1,000 patients. But as you can see here uh, on the bottom, after the adjustments, uh, there was also no difference in mortality and stroke as compare, uh, comparing uh, bicuspid to tricuspid using a self-expandable valve. But it's important to highlight in such in this publication that uh, when compared uh, Evolute R and Pro, the rates of moderate to severe parvovular leak was uh, uh, lower, was uh, three times lower uh, using the Evolute Pro uh, device as compared to Evolute R. The only uh, uh, study comparing specifically balloon versus self-expandable valves in the treatment of bicuspid valve was the BEAT International Registry, uh, not very uh, large registry, almost 400 patients included. Uh, and as you can see here, uh, Evolute R and PRU were, were associated with an increase in moderate to severe PVL as compared to balloon expandable valves, 9.3 versus 0%. Uh, however, there were four cases of annulus rupture in the balloon expandable arm uh, and no case in the uh, uh, self-expandable valve. So a little uh, you know, trade-off of uh, leak versus uh, annulus rupture in this uh, publication. So when we uh, discuss the planning and patient selection in such bicuspid patients, it's important to highlight uh, this important uh, aspect of the uh, RAFI calcification and the amount of uh, calcification of the valve. Both factors, when they're uh, absent, uh, those patients uh, do fairly well uh, in the bicuspid treated with uh, uh, a balloon expandable or self-expandable TAVR. However, uh, especially in such patients where both uh, aspects are present, uh, you have a calcified RAFI and also excess uh, leaflet calcification, uh, uh, such patients that represent one fourth of uh, the bicuspid patients treated uh, nowadays, these patients uh, might do worse uh, during TAVR. Another aspect uh, that is important to highlight is how to assess and measure uh, uh, the annulus uh, and decide uh, which uh, valve should be uh, uh, chosen for uh, these specific patients. And in this uh, publication uh, of last year uh, that Dr. David Wood and his group uh, presented, uh, it's very interesting to see that when you use the annular area, there's more uh, reproducibility between uh, 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 implanters. However, the supraannular area First, it uh, overestimate the aortic, uh, the, the, the valve that should be used. And second, uh, uh, there is a less reproducibility of the measurement, highlighting that probably, especially for uh, balloon expandable devices, the annular area should be used uh, rather than supra annular area uh, in most of the patients. Uh, with respect to the calcification that I just uh, mentioned, uh, it's important to note that in this very important uh, publication, uh, in the long-term uh, follow-up, those patients that have 
a calcified breath in addition to excess uh, lipid calcification, there was almost a threefold increase in mortality at the long-term uh, uh, follow-up. And in these patients, as you can see here, there is more aortic uh, root injury. Uh, the PVL rate uh, greater than moderate is increased. Uh, more patients needed conversion to uh, surgery with a threefold increase in mortality. Uh, another important aspect that has been published uh, recently is the aortopathy uh, factor that is very you know, frequent and present in such patients uh, uh, with a bicuspid uh, uh, phenotype. And uh, as you can see here, uh, almost half of the patients have an increased diameter of the aorta greater than 40. And uh, uh, importantly, uh, there was uh, a, a, a small increase in mortality in such uh, patients uh, with uh, uh, orthopathy. So in conclusion, a bicuspid valve can be treated with a TAVR uh, safely, in special with the newer generation devices, but CT assessment is crucial. Uh, in patients with uh, BAV uh, morphology, such as calcified raphe and excess lipid calcification, were independently associated with increased procedural complication and mortality. And this is uh, not infrequent in our uh, clinical practice, and it's uh, seen in up to 26% uh, of the patients. Our orthopathy, uh, uh, when adjusted, you know, for all the independent predictors of uh, mortality was not in, uh, associated with all cause uh, mortality. So it should not be regarded as a contraindication for TAVR in such uh, patients. So in our uh, clinical practice, I think that uh, annular and LVOT calcification, uh, the, the coronary height, as uh, sinus of Alsalva and SDJ diameters, and uh, also the, the horizontal aorta with a, a greater angulation should be factors that uh, are important uh, in our procedural planning and in selecting such patients undergoing TAVR. Probably in patients with a low uh, surgical risk, but with a high risk factors such as the calcification of the RAFI and the, the leaflets, should undergo SAVR. Uh, in, the, in those patients with low uh, uh, anatomical risk factors, uh, probably TAVR uh, uh, could be uh, indicated, especially in patients with age greater than 70 years. And in those patients with a, both uh, a high STS and a high risk anatomical risk factors, uh, uh, really the heart team uh, should uh, evaluate such patients and uh, uh, probably uh, maybe TAVR with an under-expanded uh, balloon, uh, taking into account uh, many of the anatomy of the patient, uh, uh, TAVR could be an option in such patients. So thank you very much. Uh, and I'm open you know, to any discussion. Thank you, Enrique. It's a great presentation. Uh, I have some questions. The, the first question is for uh, David, David, do you think that manipulate the volume of the balloon, in special decrease the volume of the balloon, can be affect the the durability of the valve in the long time, or, or can generate a thrombosis? I think it's a great question, and we're still collecting data. But we've always tried to give people a bespoke balloon expandable valve, much to the chagrin of Edwards in Vancouver for over twelve years now. And we rely heavily on uh, our good friends, Jonathan Leipzig and Philip Blanke and the CT core lab. So yeah, often we'll go in and we'll under oversize by one, two, three millimeters. A lot of that's now been looked at with Janar Sadanathan and others with the, uh, with the bench. But uh, if you're in that gray zone between different sizes, at least for balloon expandable versus some of the tall frame valves we use, uh, we will either under or overfill and I guess the question will be on durability. Um, to the initial point of my presentation on repeatability, um, I think that needs to be one of multiple factors when you're looking at a low STS patient with significant longevity about are you giving them the optimal THV result? And if not, perhaps is surgery a better option for that patient? Okay, thank you. Um, Enrique. 
in in the Bicou suite patient are probably young patient and have a great variability in the anatomy. In which patient do you consider that the patient have a high risk anatomy or is contraindicating in some case to make a tabby? That's a very important aspect. Uh, I can uh, after uh, hear you know what David has to say, but. Uh, in our clinical practice, I think that for, for lower risk uh, patients uh, with uh, really, you know, nasty and heavily calcified uh, valves with uh, also uh, uh, a calcified raffe, I think that uh, if such patients can undergo a surgery, Bob, probably this is the best way to go. Uh, we have had uh, recently in our uh, center at Incor, we had uh, problems even with a self-expandable valve. You know, there was uh, Evolute Pro. We implanted uh, a moderate uh, PVL. We post dilate, and we we did have a, a, a VSD. You know, a ventricle septal defect. The patient is doing well, but we know that up to fifty uh, percent of such patients having you know annulus rupture or annulus injury, uh, they they can die. You know, this is a publication from Vancouver. We participated in two thousand and twelve in circulation. So, uh, I think that uh, now with the knowledge we have, uh, I think we 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 can you know avoid uh, such cases. Um, another aspect is when you have this, you know, calcification in the LVOT, uh, I think that such factors should prompt, you know, to maybe surgery, but uh, we know that still we have some, you know, 90 years old, uh, 85 with a COPD where uh, uh, surgery is contraindicated actually. So in such patients, probably, uh, you know, using a, an underfilled balloon or, uh, you know, trying to, to uh, do a meticulous technique, maybe uh, uh, you could still go uh, with a, a TAVR in such patients, knowing this uh, risk of analyst injury. What, what do you think, uh, David? Yeah, I think everything you said makes sense. If patients are surgical, they go for surgery, whether it's the root or whether it's, you know, a very ugly looking valve with subannular calcification. If, uh, if it's not, though, since 2005, we've had multiple publications with you and others on um, bicuspid. And at least for the balloon expandable platform, it um, can be treated very similar to a tri-leaflet valve. And we've had good success with it, realizing there could be differences in pacemaker rates and other things, depending on how aggressive you are. Uh, and obviously, depending on the age of the patient, how aggressive you want to be with the final result. As you know, sometimes better is the enemy of good, right? So there you go. And you also use the annulus, right? Yes. To measure, to size. But again, we have the luxury of having Jonathan Leipzig and Philippe Blanke, right? So they're part of our weekly heart team. So that's very reassuring. Uh, I think CT planning, like everything now in TAVI is, is the gatekeeper and that dictates kind of where we're going and which platform and how aggressive we're gonna be. Thank you. Adolfo, you have any question on any comment addition. Mr. Adolfo, here. Oh, I, I have to congratulate Enrique because the presentation was fantastic. And uh, I would like to say that the concept with the bicuspid is if you are not going to use a balloon expandable valve, you have to, because you think that you are could be aggressive with the balloon, you have to take care, especially in consideration that if you use a self-expandable valve, you are also limited with the balloon that you want to use for pride dilation or for pulse dilation. Because there are a lot of people that are mentally quiet because they use self-expandable valves, but then they use a, a, a very aggressive balloon and you get the same result. So uh, you have to, to, to think about your strategy very carefully in, in such a, a difficult cases. Yeah, definitely. Okay, if 
we don't have uh, any more questions. I want to uh, express a thank you to this great group of experts, the speaker, and to share with us this, uh, this uh, great experience. And to thank you to Solasi for this opportunity and Edwards to give to us the opportunity to share with this uh, great group of experts. Thank you. Fabulous presentations. Thanks everyone. And we'll see you hopefully in person at the upcoming meetings and uh, look forward to the results of these ongoing RCTs to guide our practice. So great session. Thank you. Great session. It was great to see you. Thank Hope you. To see you soon in person. Best regard. The best for you.